Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, okay good. So let's get started. Sorry, I'm one minute late. So um, last time we started our discussion of uh, discrete random variables. So today's reading is from, I think, section 2.1 to 2.4, thereabouts. Maybe 2.2 to 2.4, okay, of the book. So um, we talked about uh, random variables and in particular for a discrete random variable, which means that X can only take on uh, finitely or at most countably many values. Then that random variable is completely characterized by its uh, probability mass function, which quantifies uh, the probabilities that X takes on a certain values X. Okay. So we, we have uh, talked about several uh, random variables uh, and uh, one of them is a binomial random variable so in this case you know, the sample space omega can be treated as the set of all um, say length n sequences of um, heads or tails uh, in length n sequence or in n tosses of a bias coin with bias P. Okay, so what that means is that uh, we consider all say length five sequences, H, 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 but there'll be two to the five of this, so there are too many for me to write down. H, 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 tails, H, and so on and so forth. All right, and the probability of heads is uh, P, probability of tails is one minus P. So that is actually your sample space omega. All right, and th that, that P there characterizes the probabilities of the elements in the sample space, okay? So now we can form a random variable X that counts the number of heads out of N. And clearly X is a random variable because it maps the sample space. So it maps each of these guys here to a number. So for example, X maps a heads, 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 tails, heads to four. And X maps heads, heads, tails, tails, heads to three because there are three heads and four heads respectively. But more precisely, we can write down probability of X K, which is probability that X takes on the value K. Now, because of this probability structure here, each head has probability P, all right? And uh, we have K heads out of N here in the illustration N is five. Then it's clear to see, and I explained this towards the end of the lecture last time, that this n choose k, p to the k, one minus p to the n minus k. And in here, one has to be careful that the k ranges from zero to n, all the integers, okay, from zero to n. Now, I just want to remark that uh, we typically use in this class k to mean an integer. So a whole number. So for a, a binomial random variable, a binomial random variable, it can only take on uh, integer value. Uh, it can only be integer value. This X can only take on integers and the integers are from zero to K. And hence we use K, but there's nothing wrong with using X as well. That's nothing wrong. It's just that there are too many X's around, all right? And by convention, we use K. You can use M if you want, but whatever. So we saw a very important property, and that is that the sum of all the elements, all the probability mass function elements, so here's P of X0, P of X1, all the way until P of Xn, this must add up to one, definitely. So this is something that one ought to check, very important check, okay? So that is the story about a binomial random variable, and it typically looks like that, okay? So it takes on values from zero, as I mentioned, to n inclusive, zero, one, two, three, and we can plot P of x, k, k here, say nine and 10, say this n equals to 10, all right? So now suppose P is equal to say 0 0.3, then what happens here is that each one of these is a stem, right? Each one of these is a particular value and it will be highest at three uh, because Zero, uh, th three here is 0 0.3 times 10. It turns out that this is the highest here, all right? And the lowest here, tapers off, okay? So this is the binomial distribution or the binomial random variable, the binomial PMF, okay? 
right? So, so is that clear? So we are going to we are going to know we're going to have a lot of practice on uh, manipulating random variables, okay? Doing computations with them. There will be no sort of proofs in this class, but we need to know how to calculate things. So another uh, any questions for you? And last time I already explained where this factor comes from. Because suppose you have three heads here out of N, you need to find the locations of the heads. You need to determine the locations of the three heads within the five tosses. And there are a total of five choose three ways for that. And that explains the N choose K term. Okay. Can I move on? Hmm. Let me see. Yeah. Is everyone here? Not everyone is here, but it's okay. <laughs> okay. So, right. Um, so another example is that of a geometric random variable. This is, okay, by the way, uh, I want to say something. The binomial random variable is typically written like this, P binomial of NP, okay? So N is called the number of trials, number of times you throw the coin, and P is usually called the probability of success. Last time we also saw a random variable called the Bernoulli random variable. And it's only parameterized by P. The Bernoulli random variable is actually the binomial random variable with one trial and probability of success P because you're only throwing the coin once. Okay. So if uh, X is a Bernoulli random variable, uh, Bernoulli random variable with, uh, we call it probability of success P, then probability X equals to one is equal to P and probability x equals to zero is one minus p, okay? So the binomial random variable actually um, is a more general object than a Bernoulli, okay? But both are in, in very important. But the next two things that I'm gonna talk about are completely different, okay? So you may have come across this in JC or Poly, okay? But the next thing I'm talking about is geometric random variable, okay? A geometric random variable comes about from this particular story, okay? We toss a coin, it could be a bias coin, okay? Uh, say with bias P, bias means the probability that it turns out heads is P, okay? That's the convention. We toss a coin, a bias coin with bias P repeatedly until the first head appears, okay? Right, so, this could model the situation where you have a shop, all right, you have a shop and uh, customers walk into your shop, but then the customers are either male or female, okay? And you want to wait until the first male appears. There could be some females who come before male, right? So this is denoted by random variable X and uh, let us see how, let us see what the PMF looks like. The probability mass function of X, which is a geometric random variable, we usually like geometric P, P is the probability of success. I don't know whether book uses this, but it's okay. This notation is good. So what's the probability that X takes on a value K? That means that, all right, let's draw a picture. The first hit occurs in the K bin. This is the K minus one, and this is a K bin. The first hit occurs here, which means that all the other bins here, all the other tosses must have resulted in something else, must have resulted in tails. Right? Must have resulted in this. Otherwise, the last one cannot be hit. So the probability would be how many tails there are here. P to the power of K minus one multiplied, sorry, this is one minus P to the power of K minus one because one minus P is the probability of tails multiplied by, let me just write it down, P. Okay, the P comes from the head and the one minus P comes from the K minus one objects here. So, what this means is that um, here we failed k times. And here it means that on the last trial, on the last time, uh, last trial, we succeeded. Succeeded. Okay. So whenever we specify the probability mass function, we also must specify the domain, all right? The values that x takes on. Now, if you look at the story here, until the first head appears, okay? In particular, until the first head appears. So what is the support of X? What are the values that X can take on? Now, if you go to Wikipedia, 
and you look up the geometric random variable, you see that sometimes it starts from zero and so on and so forth. It could start from zero, it could start from one. There are two conventions. But if we talk about this particular story here, until the first head appears, you need at least one toss, right? You need at least one toss until the first head appears. So we actually here start from k equals to one, and that is the convention in the book. But if you go, go to Wikipedia and look, all right, you will see that there are many other conventions, and in particular, sometimes you can start from zero. So we don't want to be confused. But if we read this story carefully, you need at least one toss to see ahead. You cannot have zero tosses. Does that make sense? So that's the geometric random variable. Okay, any questions? Xiaoxue? Xiaoxue? Okay, I tell you how is it, why is it called geometric, right? Are you asking why is it called geometric? Why we call it geometric? Yeah, or let me tell you very shortly, okay? But before I tell you that, let's draw a picture, okay? So now, the geometric random variable only takes on values on the integers, zero, zero, one, two, three, four, and so on and so forth. So you notice, from the formula that this p1 minus p is less than one. So this is actually decreasing as a function of k. So initially we have this bar here, which is p. Oh, it doesn't start from zero, I'm sorry. It starts from one. So this is p. Then it goes down to one minus p. Here, one minus p times p. And then here it is what? 1 minus p squared p, and here is shorter, etc. 1 minus p cubed p. So I'm, I'm going to answer uh, Liao Xue's question soon. Why is it called geometric? Okay, but uh, we will answer this shortly. So these are the bars, all right, that characterize the geometric. Okay, so now we are almost time. We, we need to check something that the, the probability mass function is non-negative and it sums to one. So we have to have this, all right? We have to have that this is equal to one. So let's check that this is equal to one. So this is some k running from one to infinity of one minus p to the power k minus one to the p, all right? So we can actually do this uh, in closed form. So this, so actually the p is constant. It can be brought outside. So we have some k running from one to infinity of one minus p to the k minus one. Now, I do not know whether you learned uh, this fact or not, but there's this thing called a geometric series. I think this is taught in O level, so everyone should have had it. So if you have a sum of a r uh, k, k equals to one to infinity, uh, better to zero, okay? Then what you have is a over one minus r. Do you remember this? Now, what is wrong here? This is almost correct. Does anyone know what's wrong? Anything wrong here? Let me ask someone. Uh, uh, Liao Xue, almost correct. Who can give me a more correct version? Ada Bell? What is the condition we need here such that the infinite series can be represented by A over one minus R, you remember? Liao Xue, almost correct. Let me look for some names here. Ng et te. Yeah, okay. Next time, okay. R must not be one. True. Can okay, R be two? Can R be two? Okay. The correct way to say this is that absolute value of R must be less than one. Okay. Right. So now, so suppose P is not zero or one. Okay. Then we can, uh, well, if p is equal to one, then also okay. So I think p cannot be equal to zero, all right? So p cannot be equal to zero. Then, then this series is absolutely convergent, which means that you can do, you can apply the formula, okay, a over, this one starts from zero, okay? So more generally, you have the first term on top. The first term is on top, all right? So the first term here, you put k equals to one, you recover one because, one minus one is zero and anything power zero is one, okay? Then you have one minus one minus P because the R in this case, the R in this case is one minus P. So you have one minus P here. 
okay? Now we assume this P is not zero, then we are okay. Then we can apply this geometric formula, geometric series formula. And this is nothing but one because this P cancels that, all right? So as you can see here, the reason why it's called geometric random variable, right? It's because it's characterized by a geometric series. This answers uh, Liao Xue's question. Any more questions? So this is the first time. Okay. We have not covered probability density yet. Probability density is something that you're not meant to know now. But probability density is used to characterize continuous random variables, which we'll talk about after the term break. From now, for now, uh, when we talk about discrete random variables, we will talk about PMF and PMF probability mass function only. Density is to be used for continuous, which we have not covered. Is that clear? So we have discrete and continuous random variables. And here we talk about probability mass function. The abbreviation is PMF. Here we talk about probability density function. But we'll cover this much later and we call this PDF. Okay, so this is a very important terminology, okay, that you want to remember. Okay, but uh, not now, all right? Everything now we have talked about is only PMF, simpler. So the last random variable that we want to talk about is the Poisson random variable. And uh, Poisson random variable, there is a story to this, but I will not uh, tell you the story because it's a bit beyond you at this point in time. So let me tell you that this PMF can be characterized by this particular, uh, I'm sorry, this random variable X can be characterized by this particular PMF. So a Poisson random variable, just like uh, the previous random variables, is always parametric. There's some parameter. So for example, for the binomial, you have two parameters and P. For the Bernoulli, you have one parameter, which is just P. The geometric also has one parameter, which is P. So the Poisson has this parameter, which is lambda. And lambda has a name. It's usually called a rate. Okay. So the probability mass function for the Poisson random variable looks like this. Lambda to K over K factorial. All right, and here K starts from zero. We always have to specify the support. That means the set of the values that the X can take on. Okay, now the fact of the matter here, and you don't really need to know this line if you don't know, this is a legitimate PMF. And a PMF has to satisfy a few things. The, the, the values must be non-negative. And as you know, the sum over all possible K of PX of K must be equal to one. This is legitimate. Right, so this is obvious and we don't really have to check this. All these things are non-negative. The rate must be non-negative, okay? K factorial is non-negative and E of anything is non-negative. So we don't need to check that. The only thing we need to check is that the summation is equal to one. So the summation over K from zero to infinity of PX of K is equal to, well, they can bring the constant E to the minus lambda outside. K E running from zero to infinity of lambda to the K over K factorial. Now, some people know what is Taylor series, some people do not, but never mind. This guy here, this very strange object can be written as follows. One plus lambda, plus lambda squared over two factorial, plus lambda cubed over three factorial. And if you know it, good. If you don't know it, I'm not ever gonna test you, but this is the Taylor series for e to the lambda, okay? There's such a thing called a Taylor series that I actually teach in the math department properly, but we don't need to know it here. So what you're left with is e to the minus lambda, e to the plus lambda, which is equal to one. So this is the legitimate PMF. And you might think that people pluck this PMF out of the sky and there's no story, but I just want to leave you with some small remark that this can model um, the number of arrivals to a particular shop to a shop in a unit time. So people often use the Poisson random variable to model the number of arrivals to a particular shop in a certain fixed time unit. And that's why this is called the rate, is the number of customers that arrive in your shop per unit time. Okay? So, yeah, so I, I, teach a, I teach a graduate level class uh, on probability. Um, and I talk about this sort of thing in great detail, but we don't need it here. Okay? But here there's one more remark that I, I would like to make, and that is the Poisson random variable is an approximation to the binomial random variable. 
that we discussed above, uh, in the regime of small p and large n. Remember that the binomial random variable is characterized by two parameters. One is called the uh, number of trials n, and one is the probability of success p. Now, it turns out after some algebra that I will not ever test you, that the probability mass function for the uh, Poisson random variable, which is this, is approximately n choose k. This is the part for the binomial random variable, 1 minus p, p to the power k, 1 minus p power n minus k. For all k running from 0 to n, if um, lambda is equal to np and p is small, n is large. Okay, so basically the PMFs of the Poisson, this is the Poisson PMF, and this is the, uh, what? This is the uh, binomial PMF. They match up when the parameters satisfy this relationship, okay? In the regime of P small and large. So whatever this means, okay? And what, what that, when, when we do mathematics, we, we cannot tolerate this approximation sign, but this is true. Okay, that uh, I, I will not uh, bother to explain here. But if you're interested, the book has an exercise that is solved in which they justify this approximation properly. It's one of the soft exercises in the Berserker's book. Okay, so, uh, right. Right. Are there any questions here? Any questions at all? Uh, uh, Irfan, uh, did I answer your question properly? Okay. So now I want to switch gears and talk about transformations of random variables. So when, so lambda is any non-negative non number. It is a rate. So it's the, the, the number of customers that come into your shop on average per unit time. Say in one hour, what is the expected number of customers that come into your shop? That is what lambda represents, okay? That's, the, it's, that's why it's called rate, rate of arrival. Uh, in one hour, how many customers come to your shop on average? That is what the Poisson random variable tells us, but this as much as I can tell you without actually having, without actually deriving it uh, from scratch for you, which I do in my graduate class on probability, but not, not here, okay? Yeah, so lambda is any real number that is non-negative. Cannot be negative, a rate cannot be negative. Uh, you cannot have people leaving, uh, right? You could, but then you need another process to, to describe that, okay? So now I want to switch gears and I'll talk about functions of random variables. Okay. So, so what do, they, the, the, do I mean by that? So let's say X is a, a random variable describing today's, uh, uh, the current temperature, sorry, the current temperature in degrees Celsius. All right, so that is a random thing, right? Um, that is influenced by many factors, where you are, you know, where, where, whether you have some shade or not. So there's a random variable, it's some random thing. Okay, describing current temperature in degrees Celsius rounded to the nearest digit, rounded to the nearest integer. Okay, so, that, so as to make it discrete. I, I don't, we, we don't deal with continuous things, okay, as of now. So everything I talk about pertains to probability mass function to answer Irfan's question. Now, oftentimes, um, you know, you may not just be satisfied with uh, temperature in degrees Celsius. This book uh, that we read is uh, actually the book used by um, MIT. Uh, so, so they are in the US. They, they, talk, they don't talk about degrees Celsius. Uh, and they talk about Fahrenheit. So you could consider uh, transforming this random variable to a Fahrenheit um, system. Okay, so why is a new random variable describing the same thing Describing the temperature in Fahrenheit. Okay. Now, um, okay. So the, in order to transform uh, your temperature from degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit, you use this formula. Okay, you can find it on Wikipedia. 
So now whatever things we do on X, we can also do on Y. We can also observe Y and do something, right? So oftentimes we are given access to some uh, probability mass function for X. And we want to say something about the probability mass function for Y, okay? So that is something that uh, you will have to know how to do in uh, some detail. So more generally here, we have this linear map, right? So we have some function of X, which is A of X plus B. Let's just collapse all these numbers into A and B. So, so we don't carry all these around. And so now we have this uh, random variable with, dense, with probability mass function P, X. We want to say something about Y. How do we do that? So the, the question I want to address now is how to get the PMF of Y given the PMF of X, all right? So now basically the, the answer is the following. Look at all the values or look at all the values of X that give a particular value of Y and sum them up. And this should be little y. Sum them up. Okay. Now, let us do a formula here. So P of y of y, that is the probability mass function of y. So that's your new random variable. It's basically the sum over all possible values of x, such that gx is equal to y of P x of x. Okay. So that's the general formula, but we want to, we don't really care so much about the formula. We want to know how to use the formula. Uh, that is what is uh, important in this particular class. PMF of X. Okay. So we want to know how to use it uh, more so than um, uh, where it comes from and how to derive this sort of things is not so important. So let me give you an example. Okay. So now let us consider X being a uniform random variable. I didn't actually talk about what's a uniform random variable, but I think it should be clear uniform discrete random variable on the set minus four, minus three, minus two, all the way to three and four. So it takes on nine values altogether. So the picture is as follows. So we have this. Px of k, all right, k. As I'm saying, we always use k for integer, but it's not so critical, right? So if it's a uniform random variable, it takes on the same, same probability for each uh, value. And here are the values here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4. Okay, so if we can take on only these uh, values here, what do you think is the probability mass function? What do you think is the probability mass function for each particular point, say this one? What is the value here? Uh, let me call on people. How about Edwin Go? Can you give me an answer? Yes, thank you very much, Edwin, for your participation. So we have everyone is uniform and one over nine because there are nine values altogether and you have to add up to one. So very good. Okay, so this is all one over nine here. All these are the same. So that's what I mean by uniform random variable. We actually haven't formally defined it, but it should be clear. Okay, so now I'm interested in the particular operation that is nonlinear. Okay, quite interesting. So now I want to create a new random variable y equals to x squared for some reason. I'm going to create this. And I want to understand uh, what is the PMF of y. What's the probability mass function of y? So in order to do this, all right, we have to first figure out what are the values that y can take on. Now, if X can take on these values, right? What are the values that Y can take on? That Y can take on? Ah, uh, well, you take zero squared, what do you get? You still get zero. Now you take uh, one squared, you can, uh, you will get one. And then minus one, you square it, you still get one. Okay, then Say two and minus two, you square it, you still, you get four. Nine, 16. So you can only take on these values, right? You can only take on these values, no more, no less. Okay, because of the structure of X. 
if x can take on the values minus four to four, then y can only take on these integer values. Okay, so now let us figure out what is probability of y. Let's remember this particular formula that looks a little bit scary, but it's not, okay? We want to figure out what the probability mass function of y. Let's use the formula first, and then let's use a picture later on. So let's figure out what is py of say zero, okay? Zero. So now we are looking at all the axes. We are looking at all the axes such that the mapping G, which is the mapping G, all right? Gx is equal to x, okay? So we are looking at all the values of x that yield y equals to zero. That is exactly only one point Px of zero, which is one over nine, okay? You agree? Now, I will ask you a more complicated question now. How about Px of one? Okay, Px of one. Okay, so which values of x result in y equals to one? Look, these are the values of x. Which, which are the values of x such that y is equal to one? Um, yeah, very good. So, yeah, you're following me. Minus one and one plus px of minus one. So that's one over nine plus one over nine, which is two over nine, okay? So similarly, we have the same situation all the way, all right, until four. Uh, Okay, so here we have dot, 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 and this is, say, uh, let me just be very lazy and erase all this, okay? PY of 16, okay? You can only take on these values. I'm only going to do 0, 1, and 16. You, you interpolate the middle, okay? So 16, which are the values of X that satisfy GX equals to 16? The two values of X are X equals to 4 and X equals to minus 4. So I put four and minus four here. And what we have is one over nine plus one over nine, which is two over nine. Okay, is it clear? Okay. So well, now what we have is that uh, the probability mass function of Y can be completely determined. If Y is equal to zero, you're one over nine. If Y is not zero and in particular one, four, nine, 16, you are two over nine. And this should add up to one. Okay. So you have one over nine, Okay, sum over all possible values of y, py of y is one over nine plus four times of two over nine, which is one. So that's good, we check that. Okay, is that clear? Hang on, huh? let me do one more uh, picture. Uh, so we have this picture here, which is the probability mass function of x. And now we want to find out what is the probability mass function for y, okay? So y can only take on a few values, 0, 1, 4, 9, and 16. So now the idea here is as follows. Here you have this uh, particular stump here, this here. This one comes here. It gets mapped here, right? This is the only place it goes here, okay? Now, now here for one, my, one and minus one, you have this stump here and adding on to this stump here, okay? So in total, you will have, let me do a color. This one comes here and this one gets mapped here. So this one becomes two over nine. Initially, you are only one over nine here. And of course, similarly for the rest of the, or the rest of the probability masses here, here you go to here and say, here and here, you come here. And finally, you have, uh, I ran out of colors already, sorry. <laughs> here and here. And these are formed by the four and a minus four. And so they, they all map over there, as you can see. And so these are all two over nine. So that's your new uh, probability mass function for y. Do we need to write zero otherwise? You can write whatever you want as long as you know what you're doing. I prefer to be very explicit and write y equals to zero and y equals to one, four, nine, 16. Don't, don't, please don't write y not equal to zero or otherwise because it's very ambiguous. Why not equal to zero? Not equal to zero can mean anything, right? But why specifically are these values? Okay, understood? 
So I finish this page. Okay. Now let us talk about a few more things. All right. So today, yeah, let me go through expectation. Is, is that clear? Any questions on this transformation? Hopefully it's clear, right? So basically this is very pictorial. The way that the book does it, the, the way that I do it is quite pictorial. Any questions? Uh, Edwin Go. Sorry, I, I call on the person I see. Okay. Now let, let us now move to section um, 2.4 on expectation variance. Okay, this is perhaps a little bit challenging already, right? Okay, so this reading here, this is, this is the topic of expectation variance. Some people may have seen this sort of thing before. Some people haven't. So if you're seeing this the first time, uh, you need to, you need to uh, listen up and um, read the book because I can only go through uh, some examples. I cannot go through all of them. Okay. So this is section 2.4 on expectation and variance. So as you know, if you're given a discrete random variable x, then you can talk a lot about its probability mass function, which is px of x. That is nothing but the probability that x takes on the value x, okay? So this PMF here gives, um, provides several numbers, okay? Just like this, it provides us with several numbers, okay? All this here, gives several numbers that quantifies the probabilities of each element, probabilities of each x that capital X takes on, okay? But sometimes we are very lazy and we don't really want to talk about taking on uh, too many values. We care about just uh, a summary statistic. For example, if I were to look through the um, scores of individual students in my class, then I will have to look at 40 plus scores. Uh, if I don't want to look at 40 plus scores and I am only interested to know whether this class of students is doing well, perhaps I'm only interested in the mean or the median, right? So we want to make clear what we mean by the mean or the median and some statistics uh, in, a, in a precise way. So just as an example, if we have a four-sided die, have a four-sided dice uh, with probabilities P1, P2, P3, P4, and obviously the sum of these probabilities must be one. Uh, and we toss it n times, okay? Then um, the expectation or the mean, the expectation, that means the average or mean can be taken to be can be taken as right n1 times 1 plus n2 times 2 plus n3 times 3 plus n4 times 4 divided by n, where ni is equal to the number of times that you see i. You see phase i. All right. But then you can imagine that ni over i, ni over n is approximately pi, okay? So ni is the number of times that you see i. A pi is a probability of seeing i. So the average number of times you see i, which is this ni over i, should be about the probability, right? So for a fair, uh, for a fair dice with four faces, the probabilities are one quarter. So maybe about one quarter of the time you will see, uh, I. So that's also called relative frequency in the, in the homework set. All right, but never mind. I don't use this term relative frequency. Okay. So it makes sense to talk about the expectation as this particular uh, quantity. All right. So let us define now the following. So given a random variable X with PMF, PMF, PX, 
say discrete, all right? We are always dealing with discrete random variables, so I don't want to make it uh, too, too longish, all right? The expectation or mean, we will use these terms expectation or mean interchangeably, okay? Expectation is the same as mean in our context. It's, it's denoted as this strange symbol expectation value of x, sum over all possible value of x, p x of x. All right. So here, what I'm trying to do is here, this is the random variable and it's uppercase, as I mentioned, this is the random variable. And these are the values that X takes on, right? These are the values that X takes on. And it's lowercase. Okay. So um, this is the definition of the expectation, okay? the mean, right? So we will have to calculate, we will have to know how to calculate expectations extensively in this module, all right? So let me give you an example, okay? We are gonna to toss two coins independently, two tosses of, uh, two say independent tosses of a coin with bias P. Let's say the bias P is three quarters. That means the probability of heads is three quarters. And the random variable of interest X is the number of heads obtained. All right. First and foremost, you would know that the number of heads that you can obtain is either zero, one or two. You can be very lucky and get two heads or you can be very unlucky and get no heads at all or zero heads. Okay. So these are the only possibilities for X, only possibilities. So now, in order for us to compute the expectation, as you can see, we need to get our handle on the probability mass function. Then we need to plug into this formula. So it's our job to then find the probability mass function, Px of k. All right. So k can only take on three values, k equals to 0, 1, and 2. So what is the chance that you get no heads, k equals to 0? Can anyone tell me? No heads. Javen? I see your name. I don't get any hits at all. So I only get tails. So among two tosses, what is the chance of getting two tails in this particular setup? Come on. Uh, David Woodside, uh, tails, tails, yeah. So that is one over four squared. Thank you very much. Now, in an analogous way, this is three over four squared, all right? So the, what, whatever is remaining must be here. Whatever is remaining. Yeah, Javen, thank you. Uh, whatever is remaining is here. And actually you can compute this as two of one over four, three over four. Okay, so now let's make this look a little bit nicer. This is uh, one over 16. This is nine over 16, which means that this is six out of 16, right? This, that's the only hope left. K equals to zero, K equals to one and K equals to two. So the expectation is nothing but, right? The expectation is nothing but, okay, you take this value times this value, this times this, then this times this, and add it up. So we have, uh, well, there's a formula, x, uh, maybe I do k now, k, k, p, x of k. So we have a zero times one over 16, plus one times six over 16, plus two times nine over 16. All right. Um, after you are said and done, 18, 18 plus six is 24, this is three over two. Okay, so expectation can also be uh, regarded as center of mass, center of gravity. Okay, why, why, can, why can this be regarded as so? So in this particular random variable, it can only take on three values, zero, one, and two. And if you tabulate this, if you draw this out, you see this one over 16, maybe it is too high. One over 16. And this is six over 16. And that is nine over 16 here. Maybe this should be a bit higher, but uh, you, I think you get the idea. And this is P of X of K. All right, and this is K. And so the center of, what is the center of gravity of, of these uh, three spikes? Well, after some calculation, we showed that the center of gravity is somewhere here, which kind of makes sense because it is somewhat biased towards the right-hand side. And that is the center of gravity, CG, or the expectation value of X. 
Okay, because this is the masses are biased towards the right hand side here. There's very little mass. So you expect the center of gravity, you know, to make this whole thing balanced is somewhere here. It's believable, right? So that is an interpretation of expectation. Is that clear? Is this, is this example clear? Uh, okay. I'm not going to call on people. I'm going to call on people when I want to ask a question. Okay. So now let us, uh, let me see. Okay. Let me talk about one more concept. Let me just talk about one more concept before we take a short break. Okay. All right. So uh, this uh, concept of expectation is very important. Expectation is also called the mean. It's also called the, sometimes I, I am very verbose and I call it the expected value. There's a long winded way of. Is this related to the bias times max K value? Hmm, I don't really know how to answer this question. I do not know as bias in this context, but I don't think this is uh, related to bias times max K value. All right, so I was about to say that the expectation has many different terms, expectation, mean, expected value. And one more thing, first moment. All right, so these all mean the same thing. All mean the same thing. They, they are slightly, they are not the same as median. Median is a different thing. You may have heard of median, but we don't need to talk about the median in this class, all right? But the expectation value can be expressed in terms of at least four terminologies, okay? Now, once you have first moment, you would think, right, that mathematicians would have come up with the second moment. All right, the second moment is not exactly the variance, but it's closely related to it. So I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna introduce the notion of the variance, okay? So the variance roughly speaking quantifies the spread or the dispersion, the spread of a certain random variable, okay? You can have a random, random variable, two random variables can have the same mean, but they could have radically different variables variances. Three over four times two bias for H times max K. No, 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 no. Your formula is only a coincidence. All right, it's only a coincidence, I believe. Right? I think it's a coincidence that it happens to be like this. So we have to actually do the, um, the proper math in order to calculate the, 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 the probability mass function for X and then plug into the expectation formula. I believe so. All right, but the variance is uh, the following. It quantifies the spread of a random variable. You could, you could have two random variables that have zero mean. All right, so this random variable, which has all the mass on one, Px, Px of k, it has one, pro the probability mass function is this, and you have another random variable whose probability mass function, let's say prob P of, uh, let's say, z of k, is one third, one third, one third, Okay, minus one, okay, minus 10, zero, 10. Okay, so this probably, these two probably, these two uh, random variables have the same expectation and that expectation value is equal to zero. But the spread is different. As you can see, this is spread out much more, spread out much more. It has some uh, interesting spreading effect. Okay, so, we want, to use the, we want to use a certain uh, statistic known as the variance in order to quantify the spread. Variances here are different. Okay, so the variance definition, the variance of a particular random variable is defined as, um, and it's re re written as variance of X is expectation value of some special function, which is uh, x minus expectation value of x squared. Now, now you, you may find this very confusing. The first time I saw this, I was also very confused, okay? But this, this quantity here, this number here, this is a fixed number. This is a fixed number, okay? So what we are interested in is basically the x, the random variable x, take away a fixed number, square it, and take the expectation. 
So for example, if your expectation is equal to zero, that's what we call a zero mean random variable. It's very convenient. Then the variance is nothing but the expectation of X squared. Okay, and we, we saw uh, a particular random variable Y just now, which is X squared, and we computed it. We, we are going to compute its expectation soon. Okay, so this is a fixed number. We are basically considering the particular function G of X is equal to X minus expectation value of X or squared. Okay, and we are plugging this function inside here. So I know this is a little bit confusing, but uh, it's not very difficult. So I just want to write out a remark. Since x minus expectation value of x is always non-negative, the variance is actually non-negative. It's definitely non-negative. It cannot be negative. So the spread cannot be negative. You cannot have negative spread. Okay. All right, so there is a definition. So let us try to do some examples. All right, so now let us um, do some examples before maybe we take a short break. So now let's consider this particular example where we have a uniform random variable on minus four to four, okay? So let's consider this example and let's compute its variance. Okay, this is an example. We saw this example just now. This is one over nine throughout. Now, it is clear from symmetry that the expectation of X is equal to zero. Go and figure this out, okay? Exercise. So if you use the center of gravity uh, interpretation, right? Then the center of gravity is of course here, right? Because uh, you're balanced on the left and on the right. So it's believable that the expectation value is zero, okay? So now the variance reduces to the following simple formula, which is expectation value of X minus expectation value of x squared, okay? But this guy is zero, so you're left with expectation value of x or squared, okay? But just now, as I mentioned, we computed the, expect we computed the um, probability mass function of y, which is x squared. And the probability mass function of y, we saw just now, it has two flavors. It's one over nine if y is equal to zero, and it's two over nine if y is 1, 4, 9, and 16. We saw that just now. So the expectation value of x squared is equal to the expectation value of y, which is this guy here. So let's compute this expectation, okay? The variance of x is the expectation value of y because y is x squared. So now let's compute this as a, as a form of exercise for expectations. So expectation means you take this number multiplied by this number, this number multiplied by this number and add it up. So you have zero times one over nine plus one times two over nine plus four times two over nine plus nine times two over nine plus 16 times two over nine, right? So after you're all said and done, that is 60 over nine. All right, so that's one way to compute the variance. You first compute the probability mass function of this monster random variable here. But in this case, this random variable here is not very difficult because it is zero mean. So we have already computed the square of this uh, random variable, which is given by this new probability mass function. And then what happens is we basically plug the formula for the expectation, plug the numbers into the formula for the expectation. So I skip one step here. This is sum over all possible values of y, y, p, y of y. Okay, and it's exactly equal to this calculation here because we take zero multiplied by one over nine, one multiplied by two over nine, four multiplied by two over nine, nine multiplied by two over nine, and finally, 16 multiplied by two over nine, we get this. And if you do the bookkeeping properly, you get 60 over nine. Okay. Okay, so uh, any questions about this calculation? Uh, David Woodside, any calculations? Any questions? I see your name there. Uh, people still with me? Uh, let me ask some random people. How about Valencia? You like to ask me questions? Valencia, is this clear? With me? All right, very good. So now let's take a 10 minute um, break and come back at 3.05, okay? We come back at 3.05.
Okay. Okay. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Let's let's resume. I don't have too much more to say today. Not very heavy, but we still have some uh, small little bit of material to cover before we finish the variance part. Okay. So now um, I want to talk a little bit about some surprising connection, some surprising way to compute the variance. Okay. Um, just now we saw one way, and that is basically to compute the probability mass function of y first, which we can get through here. Before we take the expectation value of y to compute the variance of x. So y is this new function, x squared, and this x squared because this was zero mean. This x has zero mean in this particular case. Okay, so um, is this the only way to do it? Do we always have to find the probability mass function of y before we actually can compute the variance of x? Actually, no, there's a shortcut, okay? There's a shortcut. So more generally, okay? We have some discrete random variable x and we have some function of x, let's call it y, which is g of x, okay? For example, x squared, or for example, x minus expectation value of x squared. This is also a function of x. Okay, note that expectation of x is a fixed number. It's not a random variable. Now, we want to be able to compute the expectation value of this new random variable gx, okay? Now, there are two ways of calculating it. First, find the PMF of y, which is gx, then compute its expectation, which is what we did just now. Okay, so, but actually this is long-winded. This is a long-winded way, which I don't like. Okay, this is what we did just now for the variance. Now, B, another way is the following. Use a formula. Use the following formula. So expectation value of G of X is equal to sum over all values of X g of x, px of x. Okay, so this requires actually a proof. I mean, this requires a, a small justification because now this is a new random variable y. We should really be computing sum over y, py of y, of y like that. Now, the fact that this is equal to this requires justification because now this guy is the that a probability mass function of x. This is a property mass function of y. Now, we have to justify that these two are in fact the same. This is not clear a priori. That means this requires a small little proof. Okay? You can, but I want you to appreciate that there's something to show here. There's some subtlety. Because if we want to compute this, the right thing to do is to regard this as y and then compute the expectation value of y and not to take a shortcut and not compute the uh, expectation of value of y and just use the uh, probability mass function for x and plugging it into this formula. This seems to be a very shortcut. Okay, but this is correct and shortcut. So that's a good thing. But in order to use a shortcut, we must make, the, make sure that the shortcut and the long winded way yield the same number. So here's a fact. I don't want to call it a theorem, but here's a fact. Okay, that uh, expectation value of g of x can be computed in two ways. All right, this is equal to sum of x gx px of x, which is equal to sum over y y py of y, where y is equal to g of x. Okay, so there is something to show here. There's something to show. And I want to show you this, okay, even though it's a bit long winded. Okay, I, I mean, I mean, this way of computing uh, expectation of G of X is long-winded. This is the shortcut. These two are the same, but the proof, which you may or may not want to know, all right, is long-winded, okay? But you, it's good to know, right? I will not ask you to do this sort of proof. Huh? Uh, this is a computation class, okay? So let, let's start with the, uh, let's start with the, say, setting y equals to g of x. Then the expectation value of g of x is nothing but the expectation value of this y, 
which is given by this standard formula, sum over all possible values of y, y, p, y of y. All right, so I'm just using, I'm starting from the vanilla formula, the standard formula here, the standard formula. Okay, but now from our discussion previously, how do we get the probability mass function for y? We get the probability mass function for y by collecting all those x's such that under the mapping g of x, we get y. Now, this was something that we talked about at the start of this class. Okay, so that is nothing but py of y. py of y is basically obtained by looking at all those values of x that give y and summing up the probability masses of x. This is a formula that we we presented at the start and I'm not going to scroll back up anymore. Okay, these are the same. So now what we are going to do is, okay, the following. So this is sum over y, sum over x such that gx is equal to y. We're going to put a y inside. Okay, so what we are doing is we are putting the y back into this sum here. We, can, we are allowed to do this, no problem. Okay, now, but you notice now, that you have a y here, all right? And y is all g of x, the same thing. So we can replace this by summing over x, g of x equals to y. This is g of x, P y, px of x, okay? And this, this comes about because, this g of x comes about because of this y here. All the y's are the same as g of x, okay? And this condition here, of course, all right? Okay, so now what do we have? We can actually collect, collect all these sums together. And this is basically sum over all possible values of x, g of x, px of x as desired. So this is basically the formula, the, the shortcut formula, let me call it, the shortcut formula to computing the expectation of some function of x. Is that clear? Is there any step that is unclear? So maybe the step that's unclear is this transition here. How come you how come this becomes this sum here? So you can think of it this way, all right? So you have various values of x here. Various, these are the x values. And they go to the y values. See, the y values are this. So the function g actually does the following. This function g maps like this, for example. Okay, these are the y values. So now, what, what, we are, what are we doing here? We are summing over all those y's, such, and then we are summing over the x's, such that the mapping g yields y. So for example, this is y1. You are summing over those x's here, in this sum here. Okay. Now then this is y2. Then you are summing over these x's in this sum here. Next thing here, this is y3, and then you're looking at all the x's such that the mapping goes to y3. So it's only this guy here. So this double sum here is actually equivalent to just summing over all the x's here. So is that clear? The last step is actually not explained in the book. So I draw this picture for you. Okay, is this, is this whole derivation clear? How about Vanessa? You have some questions? Is this clear? Uh, are you all still with me? Okay. I, I presume you're still with me. Oh, okay, clear as rain. My gosh, is that such a English statement? Okay, so now let me now do an example. Okay, all this theory is fine and well, but we need to know how to do some problems. So let's apply the above relation to the variance. Now we recall that the variance of x is equal to the expectation value of x minus expectation value of x quantity squared, all right? So this guy here can be regarded as your g of x. It's like a square, but you need to take away the mean first before you square things, all right? So last time, we first deduced 
the probability mass function of y before we took its expectation. But the previous theorem or the previous result that we have allows us to do a shortcut. Shortcut. Basically, we just have the sum over all values of legitimate values of x, x minus expectation value of x squared tx of x. All right, this is our shortcut result. So let's see whether the shortcut result actually yields the same number as the long-winded way when we compute the variance of the uniform random variable. Okay, so just a small remark. If we use the shortcut, we don't have to deduce or calculate the PMF of um, x squared, x squared, or more generally, x minus expectation value of x or squared. We don't have to go through this intermediate step, which can be quite painful. Okay, so we don't have to go through this intermediate step. So now let's comp let's look at this particular example again. Okay, let's look at this particular example of the uniform random variable supported on minus four to four on the integers minus four to four. All right. So just now we saw that uh, using the long-winded method, we saw that the variance of x is equal to 60 over 9. Let's see whether we can use the short method to get the same answer. So px of k here is equal to 1 over 9 for all k running from minus 4, minus 3, all the way up to 3 and 4. Okay, just to remind ourselves of the of the probability mass function. So let's compute the variance directly. And this is through the shortcut method. Okay, so the shortcut method says you plug into this formula. But this expectation is zero. So that makes life simpler. So here the x, uh, maybe I, I will change this to k, all right, to be consistent. So now the k only runs from minus four to four. The x expectation of x is zero, so you are left with k squared px of k. Oh, this has to be k. All right. Okay. So now all these guys here are the same. They're one over nine. They're all one over nine. Right? Because because of the picture above. It's all one over nine. Okay. So now we have the one over nine, sum k running from minus four to four, k squared. So this is one over nine, minus four squared, plus minus three squared, plus all the way up to three squared and four squared. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to press my calculator. I'm not going to press calculator, but you can trust me that if you do press your calculator and press it correctly, you'll get the same answer. So this corroborates the formula, the shortcut formula for computing the variance or a, fun or a function of a particular random variable. Okay, com com corroborates the shortcut formula to compute variance of x using just the sum over x minus expectation value of x squared px of x, okay? And we do not have to, we do not have to deduce the PMF of x squared or its uh, centered version, all right? We do not have to do this long-winded thing, all right? We can just directly plug into this particular formula, all right? So, so, so it's the same as a long-winded calculation just now, corroborates the shortcut formula because we get the same number, 60 over 9. All right, am I still, am I still right as rain? <laughs> okay, I have a few more things to say. Um, maybe three or four more things, but uh, it's not too, not too um, heavy, all right? So these are kind of obvious facts that I will try to uh, justify right now. Okay, so these are some properties of uh, expectation and variance. 
okay? So now let us consider just a linear function. Oh, by the way, some people like to call this affine function, but they are roughly the same. Uh, affine function, if you wish. Y equals to G of X, which is say AX plus B, All right? Some people call this affine function. So we want to figure out what is the um, expectation of Y in terms of the expectation value of X. So that is nothing but uh, expectation value of AX plus B. But by using the shortcut formula, we sum over all possible values of x of ax plus b, px of x. But the sum, the sum is linear, which means you can bring the a outside. x, px of x. This is capital X, okay? Plus b times the sum of px of x, summed over all values of x. So the first term here gives the expectation value of x plus b times, oh, now we need to figure out what is this guy here the sum over P of X. Does anyone have an answer? Okay, let me call on people. Uh, Vanessa. Uh, this one here. Any clue? Right, anybody? This, this thing here can be simplified. B times something. Hmm, we're not sure. Saw so we yet. Thank you very much. It's B times one. The sum over all possible values of the PMF must always be one. So that is a fact of life. Okay. So this can then be simplified into just this part here because uh, anything times one is itself. So we have this. So this basically says that expectation is linear. So expectation, the expectation operator, if you wish, is linear in the sense that you can bring out all these scale factors, all these scale factors can be brought outside and if you add a constant to a random variable, then you shift the expectation by this constant. Is that clear? Okay, just now who said don't know? Vanessa, do you understand now that this one is one? Okay, do you appreciate this? I, I mentioned the PMF. PMF must have two properties. One is that it must be non-negative and the other one must add up to one. So we have this, okay? So, um, so this is summarized by this term, expectation is linear, and that's what we mean. Then your natural question is, is variance linear, all right? So if y is equal to ax plus b, now is variance of y equals to say, a of variance of x plus b. No, this is terrible, this is not true, okay? This is not true, all right? So let's figure out what, what is the variance. We want to figure out what is this in terms of uh, of the variance of x. Okay, we want to figure out what is this in terms of the variance of x. So let's do some small calculation. So variance of y is equal to sum over uh, what do we have? Mm, how to do this? Uh, sorry, let me do this slowly. So the variance is um, expectation value of y minus expectation value of y quantity squared. That is the, that is the uh, formula. So now we can plug in things. This is sum over all possible values of x. Ax plus b minus the expectation value of y is a expectation value x plus b. Uh, this comes from the above calculation because the expectation is linear. So this comes from the above calculation squared px of x, okay? Right, so now we see that uh, this b here can cancel. So the final result wouldn't depend on the shift b. The final result does not depend on the shift at all. So you can also imagine, right, the variance is like spread, right? So if you shift the whole thing to the right-hand side, there's, there's no change to the spread, right? So what do we have here? So doing this slowly, we have a of x minus expectation value of x all squared like this px of x all right basically i'm factoring out the a here i'm factoring out side here then i'm keeping this thing here all right then now you notice that you will have a squared you have a squared multiplied by this stuff here okay this stuff here all the same all right and uh, we need to get rid of one here okay 
But we notice that uh, since summation is linear, you can have this x minus expectation value of x squared px of x. And we notice that this final sum is nothing but the variance of x. Okay, so in conclusion, the variance of ax plus b for scalars a and b is a squared variance of x. All right, so this is some something that you have to remember. All right, the whole derivation is also simple that you can also try to remember. So as you can see, you know, the point here is that if you shift, we don't affect the variance because this gets cancelled out. And the A gets squared because of the definition of the variance that involves this square here. The A must come out, A squared come out, okay? So this, this A squared um, A must come out, okay? If, the, if you scale a random variable by a scalar, then, um, then you have to multiply by A squared. So, so here, how about, how about the following uh, example? Let's say X is a certain discrete random variable, okay? Discrete DRV, if you wish. Then what is the variance of say minus five times x plus two? All right. Now, this you have to multiply by minus five squared variance of x. Okay, which means you have to have eventually twenty five variance of x. So the minus also gets killed. Okay. So this is some simple fact, right? The two also must get killed. All right, and the minus must also be uh, removed by the square. Okay. So there's some simple calculation. Uh, any questions here? Sean Eugene. Any questions I can try to collect? Oh, good. Nope. Okay. All right. So nothing for now. Okay. I still have about 30 plus minutes. So let me try to show one more fact and one more example. All right. You, you know, the variance of X is this complicated formula X minus expectation value of X or squared. So now, actually, when we actually want to compute the variance of x, uh, there is a simple method, all right? And this can be done just by computing the second moment. Usually, the second moment is easier to compute, minus the first moment, which is the mean, all squared. So I want to remind you, I want to, show, I want to, uh, to drive home the point uh, that these two are different objects, okay? This is, you first take the square, and then you take the expectation. Here, you first take the expectation, then you take the square. Okay, you see the difference, or not? And and I so here these are different things, and the brackets here are very important. Don't anyhow put the brackets. Okay, here you mean to take a square operation first before you take the average. Here you take the average first and then you take a square. And so, a direct corollary of this fact here is that since variance of x is non-negative. This means that the expectation value of x squared, all right, is bigger than or equal to the expectation value of x. Uh, is bigger than or equal to expectation value of x quantity squared, always. Well, the standard deviation uh, is the square root of this guy here. The standard deviation has got nothing to do with the, I wouldn't say nothing to do, but the standard deviation has a, uh, is the square root of the variance. It is um, the square root of this, okay? It is not quite the standard deviation, right? So this one here, this relation here always holds true because the variance is non-negative, okay? So this has also got a name, right? This is called the cauchy shorts inequality or a simplified version of the cauchy shorts inequality. This is a simplified form of the cauchy shorts but I don't think you need to know that, okay? So the, the, we need to justify this fact here that we can actually compute this complicated expression, complicated expectation, just in terms of the first and the second moments. Okay. So let, let, me, let me quickly prove this fact. Okay. So the variance of X is equal to the expectation value of X minus expectation value of X squared. So now... We have the square of two things, you know. You remember that uh, a minus b squared equals to a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. I think that's such a thing. All right. So now we can treat this as our a and treat this as our b. So we have expectation of a squared minus 2ab 
plus b squared. Can you see that? All right, so we are just making use of this simple fact here. All right, this is some algebra that you either know or don't know. All right, so now this is linear. Expectation is linear, so you can move things in. This is to expectation value of expectation value of 2x, expectation value of x, plus expectation value of expectation value of x. There are many things happening here, I understand. But many things were simplified. You copy this down, unchanged, minus. All right, so now at this point, right, this is just a number. This is a number, nothing but a number. It can be brought outside by linearity of expectation. So you have this expectation value of x multiplied by well, you have this two that can come up by, by uh, linearity of expectation as well. And you have this other expectation that can be brought down. So expectation of X is replaced by this. And this inner expectation, which is a constant, can be brought outside and brought here. Now, the final term here, this is nothing but a number. The expectation of a number is the number itself. So this is the expectation value of X quantity squared. All right. So now we can... Uh, Simplify things a little. This expectation value of x squared minus. Now this guy here and this guy here are look are brother and sister, right? They look the same, right? The minus two expectation value of x squared plus one. So you are left with minus one of them, and we are done. Okay, because that's what we set out to show this this formula here. All right, so here we are using at many points in time the linearity of expectation, okay? That we can bring constants outside and the expectation can be distributed inside. So this is some simple fact, okay? Uh, any questions on this derivation? Right, I'm just on time uh, to do one last example. Uh, any questions on this derivation? Say, uh, let me see. Uh, Sing Zhe, the last person on my list. Can you understand this? Um, am I going too fast? Or uh, here, this is a, maybe I mentioned this is a constant. And then this part here is a constant. This two is a constant. All the constants can be brought outside the expectation. How about Long Deng Jie? Is this clear? Oh, okay, I know David Woodside will reply to me. Everything is clear? All right, good. I want to do one final, uh, I want to write one final remark and then do one final example, okay? So here, um, just a remark. It is generally not true that um, expectation value of g of x is equal to g of expectation value of x. This is generally not true unless g is linear slash affine. Okay. Now, if you do not know what's affine, you just think of it as linear. Okay. But the more the more correct term is affine. Nevertheless, whatever. Okay. If g is non-linear, then there's no hope that this is true. Okay. So we're going to illustrate this using one final example that uh, allows us to combine all our knowledge today, all right, to uh, compute a few expectations and variances. So this is, a example, this is some example in the book, all right? If uh, the weather is good, which happens with probability equals to 0 0.6, then Alice uh, walks two miles, yeah, this book is written in the US to class at the speed at V equals to five miles per hour. Okay, so then otherwise she bikes to class. Well, the distance is the same, it's still two miles, okay? At V equals to 30 miles per hour. All right, so now we're gonna compute a few things. Okay, so we want to compute the mean time or the expected value of time to get to class. The expect the mean time to get to the class. 
Okay, so let's call this mean time t. All right. So mean time it has this particular uh, probability mass function. All right. So she either gets to class. She either gets to class. Um, how long does she need to get take to get to class if the weather is good? So the, the speed is five miles per hour and she walks to, and the distance is two miles. Okay. So the time taken is the distance over the speed, right? So this is the total number of hours she needs if she actually uh, walks to the class and she walks to the class with probability 0 0.6. Now she, uh, on the other hand, uh, if the weather is no good, she bikes to the class and that happens with probability four tenths. And uh, the time she takes is actually two out of 30 hours. All right. So now um, the expected value of the time she takes to get to school is nothing but, well, we take this multiply like this, right? So this is nothing but sum over all possible values of T, T, P, T, T. That's the formula for expectation. Okay, so the T is two fifth multiplied by probability six tenths plus uh, two over 30 multiplied by the probability, which is four tenths, which is four over 15. Okay, can you see? So this is some simple calculation. Okay, this is the correct way to do things, all right? Some people may think, all right, alternatively, let's compute the average speed uh, she takes, she, uh, she, she uses when uh, going to school, when going to class, okay? So uh, the average speed is the following, right? With probability six over 10, she, um, walks at a speed of five miles per hour. So multiplied by five plus four over 10, okay, multiplied by 30 miles per hour. And so the average speed is 15 miles per hour. Okay. So, okay, this is in terms of hours, all right? Um, uh, David, what are you saying that the mean time is 7.5? What is 7.5? I think this is 16 minutes, if anything. Six, if you want to convert to minutes, 7.5 hours? Why is it 7.5 hours? Who says? I, I, I verified this as well. So uh, this is basically two fifth hours multiplied by this probability plus two over 30 hours multiplied by this probability, which is this number of hours, if I'm not wrong. Uh, let's see whether I'm wrong. Uh, actually, I just copied this from the book. Uh, you can try that again, but uh, let me do this. This is 40%. Okay, this is uh, 12 over 50. Okay, this is eight over 300. Uh, it's a bit inconvenient for me to do this. Okay, but if you want to do it long-winded way, this is 300. What is six is 72 plus eight. This is 80 over 300. Yeah, so this is equal to four over 15 divided by 20. Yep, can you see? So yeah, so this is basically two miles, two miles divided by five miles per hour. And so uh, you get this uh, two over five hours. All right, so five, ah, sorry, five miles per hour. Okay, so this, this you, you get two or five miles, two or five hours, All right? So you just have to keep track of some units here. It's not so difficult. Yeah, you got the units wrong. Uh, we, we work in miles and hours, All right? For some reason, uh, this, is, this book uh, is written in the, it's written in metric units for some reason, okay? So now, we have already computed the average speed. So you might think that, oh, since we have computed the average speed, let's compute the mean of T. And I put this in quotation marks because it's incorrect. 
say this is the total distance, which is two miles, divided by the average speed, average velocity, or average speed here. This is total 2 over 15. And of course, this is not the same as expectation value of t above, which was the correct calculation. So the, the moral of the story is that is that if you have this relation t equals to 2 over v, then the expectation value of t is equal to the expectation value of 2 over v. All right. And this expectation value, you're not allowed to put the expectation value below. Not allowed. OK? You're not allowed to do this. You're only allowed to move the expectation value inside if the relationship is linear. But this is an inverse relationship, so you're not allowed to do this. OK? Not allowed. Okay. So now let me try to pass David's question. All right. So, but OK, let me try to pass David's question, see whether I understand. It seems she must move at 5 miles per hour and 0 0.5, she bites it. Yes, 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 and so. The average velocity, the average speed is this much, right? 15. Because 0 0.6 times 5, this is 3, right? This is 3. And then 40% of this is 12. So 3 plus 12 is 15. Yeah, correct. Right? And then, uh, so this is the average speed. And you may think that the average time is just the distance divided by the average speed, but it is not allowed. Yeah, so this is the average speed expectation value of V. This is okay. But you cannot relate the expectation value of the time to the expectation value of the speed. That's not allowed. No, you're not allowed because you're only allowed to talk about, you're not allowed to do this nonlinear operation. As I already said, okay, it is generally not true, this is not true, that expectation value of G is equal to expect g of expectation value of x. So in this case here, g of x, I take it to be 2 over x. Then you have to compute expectation value of g of x. But this is not the same. Okay, well, this is the same definitely as expectation value of 2 over x. But this, you cannot put the expectation value down here. You're not allowed. All right? Because expectation is linear, you cannot commute this with the this cannot commute with the, the inverse operator. Okay, not allowed. Okay. So this last statement is not true. As you can see here, these two numbers are not the same. All right. So if G is not linear, all right, then you cannot do this. Uh, this expectation and function is not commutative. Uh, that's what it's called. Now this, this number and this number is not the same. Okay, right. Uh, any more questions? Uh, maybe uh, Liao Xue, any questions? Let me ask some random people. Okay, very good. All right. So I posted the problem set three or tutorial three. You can attempt it. Uh, next week, there is no tutorial on Tuesday, but I think that is tutorial on Monday because the classes are canceled at, from 2 p.m. onwards. Right, that is the rule. That's the rule. But the tutorial on Monday is at 12. So that is before two. So that will still go on, but that I think will go on online. Uh Chao Lin is doing that, not me. Now we revert to the normal schedule. Okay. Any more questions? Ryan, Ryan Tan, any questions? Let me ask some random people here. Alvin Chi, you like to ask me questions? As of now, no, please try the problem set three is very not easy. Okay, the first few questions are easy to boost your confidence, but the last ones are really not easy. I find that there are not enough questions in the book, so I try to come up with some questions of my own. The optical one got you stumped. Yeah. It's not so easy. You have to arrange the vowels and the consonants properly. Indeed. Yeah, but any questions you can feel free to ask, okay? Yeah. Anything? Yeah, everything is a permutation puzzle. Everything is a puzzle, you know? 
Uh, I can stay around for a little bit longer, but uh, if, if you have no more questions, you can leave. If you have some questions, you can stay. Okay. Uh, how about uh, Jillian Ho? Any questions? Hadrian? It doesn't have the OIA in that order. I, I, I don't really know the question. I haven't read it, but uh, I don't think it has to be that you need to do three, three factorial, I believe, but I'm not very sure. I haven't seen the question. Okay, let, let, me, let me go back and look at it. Uh, if there are any issues with the solutions, I will fix it, okay? But I don't think there are any issues. Okay, Hadrian, have a good weekend, everybody. And see you. Bye. Take care. I'm going to log off, okay? Bye.